Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with Sweden-born veteran jazz bassist Bruno Rayberg. He opened up about his new 2023 album, Look Inside. He melds a lifetime of inspiration and experience into his debut solo bass album via Orbis Music with influences for throughout his career of greatness. Since coming to the U.S. from his native Sweden in 1981, he has made 13 recordings as a leader and 30 as a sideman with the best in the business like Terry Lynn Carrington, Jerry Berganzi, George Garza, Kenny Warner, Donnie McCaslin, Billy Hart, and so many others enjoy this story. Nice to meet you. Thank you for taking a minute out today. Oh, thank you for having me. My pleasure. Great. So, you know, before we get into your brand new album, you know, we went through quite a thing with COVID, and I want to cover this before we get into your newest album, Look Inside. How did you survive that time period, and how has it changed the way that you do things now? Well, you know, it was rough, but compared with a lot of people, you know, um, I was pretty lucky. I could, I could continue teaching at Berkeley um, online. You know, remote teaching, so that kept me busy. And um, also, I had some family here um, that stayed with us. My, my daughter and her, his boyfriend. I mean, <laughs> her boyfriend at the time and stuff. So, um, you know, it wasn't it wasn't too bad. The in terms of playing. Obviously, um, I didn't play for a long time, but I can't even remember, but it was almost, um, yeah, many months. And But then I started doing some stuff in my driveway here um, where I distinctly remember we played and the neighbors came out and brought their lawn chairs and masks and all that stuff. And we were able to play, which was an amazing feeling. Uh, you know, something you take it for granted all these years and then just playing together with people again was just really really truly amazing it must feel good now that you know the world's waking up you got a new album out how does it feel it feels great absolutely and people are coming out i'd say the places i play almost has more people than before the pandemic because i think a lot of people realize how, how important it is in their lives to to be able to, to attend live concerts yeah. And, and that's the one thing about this. Do the crowds feel different now? Is there a level of appreciation and energy that's different? I think so. I think certainly people appreciate it more because they, you know, they've taken everything for granted, just like I have. And um, they realize what, a, you know, what a, what, a, what a great experience it is usually <laughs> to, to go out to a concert. And um, that goes for, me, for myself, too. I've been attending quite a bit of, of different, all sorts of stuff um, since it opened up again. Talk to me a little bit about Look Inside. You know, this is um, your debut solo uh, album. And I'm curious, wh how does this, how did you put this together artistically? And how does it feel ultimately to have this statement out there? It feels really great. Um I mean, it really, you know, had to do with the pandemic too, because I, I kept practicing and and playing by myself um, as much as I, I could find the energy for. So, and it, it's something I've been wanting to do, I think, for a long time. But I've always been too busy with um, composing and and playing with different groups and teaching. So it was kind of. Uh, the timing thing that way that I finally I had more time to to attend to it and um, and I've always you know been doing like solo bass introductions to tunes like in in a band setting and uh, but never really done a whole project like this so um, a lot of the material um like the standard type of tunes Prilu to a kiss and my man's gone now Nardis those are tunes I've been playing sort of by my at home without having too much of a plan around it, just for fun kind of thing. Um, so those were came natural. Um, and then I have a small home studio, so everything was recorded there, which was good because I could go out anytime really and, and just hit the record button and play something. Um, and it also it can also be the problem because you can say, well, I'll do it tomorrow again. It'll be better. 
Uh, whereas if you rent the studio, you're going to have to do it that day, you know? So, <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Well, so you came here to the States from Sweden in 1981. I'd like to go back to the beginnings of your life. And and how did you get into jazz? What were some inspirations? And and how, how did that happen for you? Um, yeah, interesting. So I grew up on a farm in Sweden. Um, you know, kind of in the middle of nowhere. Um, there was a city an hour away. And um, I remember hearing jazz on the radio um, and a little bit on television. Um, but I think there was a couple of things. So my sisters, they got a turntable, that, like the first turntable around the area. And there was an album that came with the turntable that they said, well, you can play this one, but leave our LPs alone, you know? And um, much later, when I was in my 30s, I, I um, was uh, visiting my sister, and I discovered this album that uh, the, the cover looked really familiar. Um, and, it, it, and I put it on, and I knew, I, I just knew all the solos and all the tunes. I just remembered all of it. I could sing along with it. <laughs> And there was a Johnny Hodges album or Wild Bill Davison on Hammond organ. Um, I think it's called Hammond the Go Go, actually. Um, and uh, Milt Hinton on bass. And they play, um, you know, Green Dolphin Street, Sunny Side of the Street, Little Darling, um, Johnny Come Lately, um, and stuff like that. So I must have listened to that when I was like nine-ish, um, a lot. <laughs> and um, But uh, there's also, it, it was really connected with a pop group I played with, and I started listening, listening more and more to, you know, groups that would jam, really jam on solos, like The Cream, for example, and Jimi Hendrix, and, and even Deep Purple. You know the doors. Uh, I love that the that solo, the organ solo on the uh, light my fire. You know, so I think I was really drawn to to solos uh, and and you know instrumental solos that way and jamming. Um, and then I heard Train um, on the in the in the local library, and that was that was it. They kind of sealed the deal. You know, <laughs> yeah. So what was the first live jazz show that you saw that blew you away? You know, it, there was um, in the summer of 73 or 74 um, when I went to a jazz festival in Norway, in Kongsberg, Norway, and we saw a concert. It was a double bill um, between Art Ensemble of Chicago and then it was Tete Montelieu trio, the Spanish pianist with Nils Henning Ørsted Peterson on bass, Alex Real drums. So wildly different um, styles of jazz, you know, and it just blew me away. Both, both of it, um, you know, because Art, Art Ensemble had never really, certainly never seen anything live like that. I had begun to listen to all sorts of freer styles of jazz you know um so i i knew about it but i've never seen it live like that and of course in standing earth at peterson uh, it was just was just an incredible bass player that he was just jaw dropping what he could do on acoustic bass and i'd been playing acoustic bass maybe two or three years at that point so yeah that 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 stands out yeah so you've been around a lot of really legendary um, renowned players like Jerry Berganzi, George Garzone, Kenny Warner, Sam Rivers. I mean, the list goes on and on. So I'm curious, what did you get from these players that you in turn give back to students and teach younger players? Um, that's a good question. The, the devotion and strength in their playing and, and their experience you know, because all those players you mentioned, and uh, and it's also especially gu guitarist Mick Goodrick, who passed away recently. Um, he was my teacher at NEC, and he 
also I, I got him to play with my band after I graduated from New England Conservatory. I had a band for a while with Jerry Bergonzi and Bob Moses and um, Mick Goodrick. And Bruce Barth played piano sometimes. So it, it was being on the bandstand. They would give me little hints, you know, of, of what was good and what was not good and stuff like that. Um, but like the devotion and, and also a lot about communicating musically and listening and, you know, making everybody else sound good in the band. Um, and which I still find that that's something that younger people in general uh, have to learn that, that um, doesn't necessarily come that naturally. Which I understand because when you start playing jazz, it's really hard. It's a lot to harmonically and instrument technical stuff, um, you know, rhythmically that you have to take care of. So I feel that that takes up all your <laughs> brain space, so to speak. And it's not until you have some confidence in all those aspects that you can open up and listen a bit more. Um, to the to your surroundings, so to speak. So yeah, I think that's the main main part. Yeah, yeah. So in your journey as a musician, with all of the aspects from teaching to recording to playing live, what do you like the best about being a professional musician or being a practitioner of jazz? You know, it it is playing with people, the community, the feeling of going out and you know you're a band. You're making music together. It's just that that inspiration and and energy that, that you feel from doing that and and feeling with the audience too. You know that that's just irreplaceable, really. So that that's the main thing. So on your new album, what are you hoping the listener gets from this? What's your ultimate hope for the listener that gets the album? You know, it's. Yes, solo bass to me, it, it's as I, I think I wrote in the liner notes, it it's a, has a contemplative quality to it. Um, compor, compared with a really, you know, dazzling solo piano thing or or saxophone, maybe. Um, so I, I just hope that people will have a moment and where they can sit down and and just you know, contemplate and meditate maybe like musically, <laughs> uh, you know, and and I hope they find um, enough variation between the pieces, you know, so it, it just take them out of the of their regular world for 40 minutes and uh, and just feel some satisfaction from, from that. Yeah. Excellent. So Everyone out there has a perception of you, your family, your friends, your fans, your students, but ultimately you live your life. What's your perception of you? Who do you think you are? <laughs> wow, you're getting deep on me, man. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, well, you know, it's obvious that I, I feel like I was I was meant to play music. I, I, it was never a decision I made. Uh, really, it, you know, um, yeah. it's just something I've done since I, as long as I can remember, you know, and uh, and that's what I'm here to do. And I take it very seriously. I didn't always, I think. I took it for granted when in my early 20s, etc. But I'm taking it very serious, and, and I'm just feeling that this is what I've been put on this earth to do, and it's my responsibility to share it um with as many people as i can and uh it's also my responsibility to to develop develop it as far as as uh, i can um i think when i when i decided to come over here from from sweden it was a really large decision especially back then there wasn't this way before the internet it was a little bit more like a big, big leap, you know. Nowadays, I feel like people are communicating a lot, instantly everywhere on the planet. But so, I felt that, so that was a big decision, and, and I felt like 
when I decided to do that, uh, you know, pieces fell into place. I got student loan from from Sweden, um, so I could do it. And um, I felt like I'm going to take this as far as I possibly can, you know, and see see where my limits are or 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 not. <laughs> but I was I was very devoted, yeah, and and I feel I still am. I believe. Well, Bruno, if anyone wants to get the brand new album, find out more about you, anything pertaining to your world, where can they go? Um, Bandcamp is the best place, um, or through my website. It's just my name dot com, um, and it's about to be pushed out on all the streaming services on you know your iTunes and Amazon and, uh, and Spotify, Corbus and all. Yeah, all those. Um, so that's that's where you can find the music. Yeah, excellent, Bruno. This has been great. Thank you for opening up. Thank you for your time. Best of luck with the album and live shows and everything as we move forward. Yeah, my pleasure. I appreciate you taking the time and, and focusing on on a solo bass album. It's not not so common. <laughs> Thanks for listening and tuning into another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Sweden, Boston, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. Thanks to Bruno for his time, energy, and story. If you want to hear more interviews, you can find Neon Jazz interviews on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Subscribe to us at YouTube, and for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.